Welcome to Discovering. Freshwater mussels, or clams as most of us call them, can be found in pretty much every stream in the UP and beyond. And they're a lot more interesting than you may think. Then we'll check out a UP event that's been going on for 40 years. Sit back and relax. That's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Today we're here um, in Dickinson County and we're going to be surveying for freshwater mussels. Uh, freshwater mussels, they're also known as clams. So I'm going to be referring to them as freshwater mussels, but just keep in mind uh, everyone calls them clams and they're pretty much the same thing. So right here we have a creek hill splitter. Uh, you have the anterior side here, posterior over here, and then of course the, the dorsal and the ventral part of the shell. So they go in anterior side down. So if you're ever in a stream or a creek or a lake, make sure you put them down on the anterior side because uh, they filter up on the posterior side. So there's multiple ways that we can survey for freshwater mussels. Uh, one of those is by a glass bottom bucket. Other ways is through snorkeling or scuba or just by using your hands. Today the water level is low enough where we can easily use a glass bottom bucket. What we would usually do is either time searches or a certain area um, we'll measure off and we'll look in every type of habitat. We'll go slowly, make sure we um, look very closely. Mussels are very hard to find. A lot of times you only see their, the two apertures coming out of the sediment, so you have to have a trained eye. I've been doing this for about 11 years and I think I'm finally getting used to looking for mussels. They are filter feeders. They filter up to eight gallons of water per day. Um, they filter out detritus, bacteria, algae, they're pretty amazing creatures. They have a lot of unique names. Purple Wartyback, there's Fat Mucket, Bike. There's a lot of colorful names that uh, we call freshwater mussels. And they may all look the same, but they're different species. Uh, here in North America, we have nearly 300 species of freshwater mussels, by far the most diverse uh, in the entire world. Most of the diversity is located in the southeastern portion of the United States. Um, Alabama has 175 species of freshwater mussels. Here in Michigan, we have 45 species of mussels. And more locally, in the UP, we have 13 species of freshwater mussels. What makes them really unique, though, is their life cycle, how they reproduce. Um, during reproduction, you have a male and female and you have external fertilization. The female takes in the male sperm and that's where fertilization occurs. The female will hold the, um, the muscle larvae or what we call glochidia in her shelf. For the muscle to complete its life cycle, it needs to find a fish host. The female muscle is burrowed into the sediment and she needs to figure out how to get that fish to her in order to release her glochidia or her baby mussels onto the fish. She uses fish lures, mimicry. They can mimic little minnows, little crustaceans, macroinvertebrates. There's a variety of methods how these little creatures can entice a fish to come over and check them out. So once a fish does come over, uh, the female mussel will release her glochidia uh, near the fish and the fish will just through um, normal respiration, the glochidia will attach to the gills. This typically does not harm the fish, but they will insist on that fish. Um, usually it's over a couple weeks. Once they're, they're transformed into juvenile mussels, they'll release themselves from the fish and go back down into the sediment 
and start the whole process over. They'll grow into adults and reproduce from there. And for uh, most freshwater mussel species, reproduction begins when water temperatures increase. So generally in, in spring and summer, that's when most of the reproduction will occur. There's a few species that uh, go into October, but uh, the majority of them are definitely in the summertime. It's quite amazing. So that's what um, attracted me to learning more about freshwater mussels in the first place is their life cycle. A lot of wabash pig toes in this stretch. Mussels have certain ecological uh, requirements in order, in order to survive very well. Since they are filter feeders, they need plenty of free-flowing water in order to be able to, to get food from the water column. They also need plenty of oxygen, like any other organism. They also need to live in an environment where there's low sedimentation. If there's too much sand coming into the system, they could easily get buried or suffocate. Their reproduction is largely jump-started by water temperature, so they need uh, warmer water temperatures for that reproduction to start, as well as growth, but they can't have it too high, otherwise they're going to not survive well. So a lot of times you'll find mussels in what are called mussel beds. Since freshwater mussels don't move very far, they can't go swimming looking for a mate. It's in their advantage to group together and live together in a mussel bed. So often you'll, you'll find, um, once you find one mussel, you'll find, uh, you'll find a lot more mussels once you start looking. Yep, see, so just a, another example of um, an ecosystem service that freshwater mussels provide. You see the freshwater coral here growing on the mussel. And it's not inhibiting the mussel at all. It's just uh, utilizing the shell that, that's provided in the stream. And once it gets underwater, it turns bright green. But if they do need to, to move, say um, the water levels have decreased and they're along the shoreline and they're, they need to look for more suitable habitat, uh, they can move a short distance with their foot. It's not very quickly, obviously, but they're able to do it. Also, if, like, say, a, a chemical pollution event happened, freshwater mussels are often are uh, canaries in the cold mine. And they can be very sensitive to certain pollutants. Um, in particular, um, if there's high ammonia levels, you may see uh, a lot of the freshwater mussels, their shells closed. Uh, they're not able to to filter uh, in those type of events. If it's a more a chronic pollution event, you'll start seeing decreases in population over time. Unfortunately, sometimes um, that's what you'll see is a, is a chronic event where mussels are decreasing. You won't necessarily see a huge high die-off, but, but when you do it, it can be pretty dramatic. For in the internal anatomy, they have gills. Um, and then they also have a foot that helps with uh, feeding when they're younger uh, juveniles and also stability in the sediment. And they have exhalant and inhalant apertures. Sometimes the only thing you'll see when you're looking for freshwater mussels, they're burrowed so deep down into the sediment that you won't even see uh, most of the mussel. So, and then they have mussels to hold the two shells together and then mantle margins here. It looks pretty simple, but there, there's definitely necessary parts in order to make them complete their life cycles. So freshwater mussels are also known as ecosystem engineers, and they're pretty integral uh, component to a stream. Uh, they filter out bacteria, a lot of potential chemicals in the system. They increase water clarity. Uh, they provide substrate for um, fish spawning populations. They also uh, provide food for um, creatures and mammals that live along the, the river as well. Here is a dragonfly larvae, and he was living in the shell of this pocketbook. So even after they've died, they provide many uses for the animals that are currently in there. So they're a very important component to a healthy aquatic ecosystem. Obviously that's a number one goal that, that we do in our, our line of work as well, is to make sure um, they stay around. And you see his foot, his foot coming in. That's where he or she was stabilized. Some species of freshwater mussels are sexually dimorphic, meaning you can tell the difference between a female and a male. Not all of them are, but some, um, like a, a fat mucket, a female is gonna be larger on the posterior side so she can have room to grow her glochidia and eventually release it in the water columns. 
Freshwater mussels are not the same as our um, aquatic invasive species mussels that we typically hear. Um, they are not zebra mussels or quagga mussels, and they're not related as well. In fact, it's really, really important that we don't have zebra mussels or quagga mussels come into a system where freshwater mussels are because the shells of the freshwater mussels provide perfect substrate for those invasive species to attach to. I've seen lakes where zebra mussels come in. Unfortunately, the freshwater mussel pot Population, they can't compete. The zebra mussels just cover the shells completely. They're not able to feed, they just die out into a lake. So it's really important that we prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, in particular those zebra and quagga mussels. So that is a spike mussel. He blended in very well with the rock. So um, when you're surveying for mussels, you go slow, uh, make sure you look in every nook and cranny. Otherwise, uh, you can just overlook this as a simple rock. Historically, it was thought that mussels were very important to Native American tribes. At first they thought it could have been culinary for a food source. A recent study though has shown that um, mussels aren't really high in protein or calories. So it's more thought that historically they used them for tools, jewelry, some religious uh, ceremonies. And then you fast forward up to probably maybe the mid 1800s, there was an actual button industry. Before the advent of plastic buttons, we used freshwater mussels shells for our buttons on our shirts. Starting in the mid 1850s, there was about 40 button factories along the Mississippi River. Um, we had button factories as well in, in Michigan. At its heyday, it employed nearly 20,000 people in America. So between 1857 and 1963, the button industry was estimated at a value of $10 billion in today's value. Unfortunately, it was left unregulated and a lot of the mussel beds were depleted very quickly. So the mussel industry for button use did not last very long. That's one thing that greatly impacted our historical populations of mussels. This is another example of a pocketbook. You can see the thickness of this shell and why, you know, uh, before plastic, why um, freshwater mussels were so useful in our button industry. Logging has had a great impact on freshwater mussels. Dams can hurt um, freshwater mussels. They separate from those fish hosts. Some species of mussels, they actually need a very specific fish species in order to transform into juvenile mussels. You can have, say, a largemouth bass, it won't work. The immune system of the fish will kick in and it'll destroy that, that glochidia and it won't survive. You go to another fish, say like a log perch, that immune response on that fish is suitable for that glochidia, so they're able to survive and transform. Mussels are sessile species, so they can't move very far on their own. They're going to need those fish hosts, so when um, they are in place that can impede their um, their population numbers. Shells range in very small to maybe like a quarter size, probably like a sh slipper shell mussel. This is a lot larger mussel, it's a pocketbook, and they can live very old, well over 50 years old. You can um, age mussels, kind of like uh, rings on a tree. Yeah, each growth ring here you'll see is a year of the mussel's life. Count the rings on it and that can be a good estimate of how old that mussel is. There's other species that are of freshwater mussel that are even bigger than the pocketbook. Um, there's uh, a washboard that's probably um, twice as big as this. So they can um, get very large, or like I was saying, they can get really tiny, like the slipper shell, like about the size of a nickel or a quarter. It is not legal for citizens to harvest freshwater mussels, so they can't take them, um, they can't even take the shells. But I highly encourage folks who are curious to learn more about freshwater mussels to go pick them up, look at them, check them out, and then um, gently put them back where you found them. Here in North America, we uh, have the luxury of having a very high diverse population, nearly 300 species. Unfortunately, uh, probably 70% of those are at risk of uh, becoming extinct. Um, here in the UP, we have four uh, state listed species as threatened and endangered. I think that might be a cylindrical paper shell. Sometimes identifying them to species is an art form. And even after doing it for so long, you still question yourself and sometimes you gotta bring in um, other muscle heads to verify or um, let you know what species you're actually looking at. We need to, as managers, make sure that 
we uh, survey our lakes and streams uh, to get a good understanding of what we have here currently and what kind of habitat they need to survive and to thrive. We also need to make sure we do a lot of outreach to make sure fishermen, outdoor enthusiasts, uh, just the general public knows how important freshwater mussels are to our, our healthy ecosystems. Another spike mussel. You can tell uh, he's been here a while. Uh, he's probably burrowed where his shell is still dark brown. He's protected in the sediment. Over the years, you can just be exposed to the environment, various sediment, rock coming through, wear and tear where he's exposed. Another tool that we have as biologists is actually propagating freshwater mussels. Through scientific research, we're able to construct a mussel hatchery where we can grow mussels to a certain size, then release them into their native ranges. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does this quite a bit. There's a, a rather large mussel hatchery in Genoa. That's just another tool we have in order to restore the populations to historic numbers. You know, moving forward with freshwater mussel management, um, there's a lot of components that um, us as managers, we need to consider and make sure that we continue to move forward. Um, one, of course, is knowing where the populations are, making sure we preserve habitat where healthy populations are currently thriving. That means to have a, a healthy riparian area to make sure that there's no sedimentation or pollution coming into um, that system so we can preserve those populations. We also need a better understanding current stressors that are harming um, populations, uh, also emerging ones. Are we missing diseases or viruses that could be harming uh, freshwater mussels? And then lastly, and almost most importantly, we need to educate the public on how important freshwater mussels are to the ecosystem. If we can explain how cool they are and how important they are to a healthy aquatic ecosystem, um, maybe we can um, cultivate some interest and support in managing um, future actions. So hopefully this, this work will continue uh, well past my career. Oh. I know these mussels will probably last longer than my, my career. They're, they're pretty long lived. So if you are interested in surveying for freshwater mussels in your local stream or lake, um, luckily we are coming out soon with a Michigan freshwater mussel field guide. Um, and just check out the DNR's website. We will be able to uh, post a link for that and you'll be able to, to order uh, your own freshwater mussel guide, um, learn how to identify them. It'll tell you all about the life cycle and you can be a, a local expert yourself. In 2018 marks the 40th year of the Hiawatha Traditional Music Festival in Marquette. Each year's event features traditional music styles that include bluegrass, old time, Cajun, Celtic, acoustic, blues, and folk, including singers, songwriters, and dance. 40 years, wow. Uh, it's really been a walk down memory lane in the last six months. Um, we've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of the founding members over the last six months who were young 20 year olds, 20, 20, 21, 22, 23. They went to the Wheatland Music Festival down in Remus, Michigan and came back up to the UP and said, hey, we need to start a festival here. And they got themselves incorporated and they did some fundraisers and the next thing you know, they have a festival going and here we are 40 years later. They wanted to preserve the genre of traditional music. That's what Hiawatha has done over the years. It's been really tempting to move away from that as different genres of traditional music have changed and modernized, but they really have remained true to root music and Cajun music and old-timey music and bluegrass. They're really quite active in the community and sharing that kind of music and keeping that legacy alive. So the festival has a main stage which is where our headliners play. They start uh, usually around one o'clock on Saturday and go through midnight on Saturday and again uh, on Sunday in the af early afternoon and go through midnight on Sunday. We also have a second stage which is where a lot of the dancing goes on. And then Saturday when the main stage starts we have workshops in the um, main workshop tent where we have local musicians playing alongside of all of our main stage uh, performers. We have a jamming tent and then we have the dance tent which is where a lot of the family dances happen.
every festival we have a variety of food vendors. Most of them are from the local area. We try to get local area vendors. And um, this year for the first time we have a local organic farm with farm fresh produce, so that's really nice. We also have the Artist in the Round, which is a juried art show. These are all crafts made by hand. And this year we had a tremendous amount of ticket sales and we are nearly at capacity for camping. We have an area for zero to six year old um, where there's lots of crafts and we have uh, children's performers. Um, we also have a tween tent, which is for nine to 12 year olds. And then of course the teen area. And the teen area has activities and um, crafts all day too. And then there's the teen only dance on Saturday night. So this festival is uh, run by volunteers. Uh, my position, I'm a half-time position and everybody else that um, is here is a uh, volunteer. So we typically have about 500 volunteers. My job is to direct all of them, but those people really put it on. And then there's an additional 400 volunteers that work security shifts and traffic and they sell tickets and they are in the green team and they work in the children's area and they work in the artists in the round and there's just lots of different things for people to do so becoming a volunteer is really important and you earn a festival t-shirt for your first three hour shift and if you want to work two more three hour shifts you work your whole ticket off and can really attend for free. Our typical um, population is you know, a lot from the from the Upper Peninsula, for sure, and um, Marquette. Um, but we usually have anywhere from 25 to 35 states represented in our ticket sales, and usually a couple of countries. I know that there's somebody here from Kuwait. We have so many patrons that tell us that they are vacationing up here for the, for the week or the two weeks before and after the festival. So this is part of what they do when they come up here to enjoy the outdoors and everything that the UP has to offer. And you know, unfortunately, we have people in Marquette that have never attended. And this is a diamond in their own backyard and really, really encourage new people to come and, and experience this festival and um, spread the word to their friends about what, how great it is.